In this video I'm going to look at the ozone layer and in particular we're going to concentrate on ozone in the stratosphere. So we're going to look at how it was formed, how it helps us, problems associated with the depletion of ozone and solutions to the problem. So we'll start with how it helps us. So as we all know, the sun emits UV radiation. So I'm going to show that with this purple colored wave here. Now, if it wasn't for ozone in the stratosphere, so the formula of ozone is O3, then all of the UV from the sun would reach the earth. So if we think back to the greenhouse effect, remember the earth absorbs the UV and then re-emits it as infrared. So if more UV reached earth, then obviously the earth would um, heat up even more. But the other thing that's, so the other problem associated with UV is it's a very damaging form of radiation and it's very um, closely linked to skin cancer. So, luckily for us, ozone has the ability to absorb UV radiation, as we're going to look at in the video. So instead of all of the UV reaching Earth, scientists think that only about 5% reaches the Earth. So this is 5% of what actually comes from the Sun. And I haven't specified until now that it's UVB that we're talking about. There are other forms of UV. There's UVA. Now, all of UVA gets to Earth, but because it is, um, it's at a longer wavelength, don't worry too much about the physics behind this, but UVA is at a longer wavelength, which means it, it doesn't have as much energy so it's not as damaging. So UVA gets to Earth, but it's, it's not got much energy, so it doesn't cause us any problems. And UVB is the bad one, so just remember B for bad. Um, at UVC, that's got the shortest wavelength, um, but luckily the ozone layer filters out all of UVC. So that's not going to cause us any problems provided that we don't mess this ozone layer up. Obviously the problem is we are. So we're going to look at how ozone is formed now and also how it protects us from UV. So we'll start with the formation of ozone. So in the stratosphere we have oxygen molecules and they're exposed to high levels of UV. Remember, this is high energy radiation, and they will split the bond between those two oxygen atoms in the molecule. And so we'll end up with two very reactive oxygen atoms. One of these oxygen atoms will then react with an oxygen molecule and form O3. So that is how ozone is formed. So if we come on to how it protects us, now if we think about this reaction here, if this was the only process that took place, we'd be in trouble because all of the oxygen would eventually be converted into ozone. So the other reaction that takes place is actually ozone has an ability to absorb UV radiation. And again, high energy, so this will split ozone into O2 and O. So this is the protection part um, that we were talking about before. Now if you look at these two reactions, they're actually the opposite of each other. So we have the formation of ozone and the breaking down of ozone. Now over millions of years, the rate of this reaction has become equal to the rate of this reaction and so we end up with 
in equilibrium. So if I just change the arrow for this one, this is the process that we have got in the stratosphere. So just to summarise that point, you can see the equilibrium at the top of the board there. So the rate of the forward and the reverse reactions, so the forward reaction is the um, breakdown of ozone and the reverse reaction is the formation of ozone. So the rates of those two reactions have been equal over millions of years until very recently. And the problem is being caused because we've introduced new chemicals into the stratosphere which are breaking down ozone faster than it is able to form. And that's caused the ozone layer to, th to get thinner or deplete is another word. So what we're going to do now is look at the, these new chemicals. What are they? And then we'll look at the solutions that have been proposed. So some of the most damaging chemicals to the ozone layer are the chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. So we're going to look at this example, CFCl3. And eventually, CFCs, because they're so unreactive, Remember they were used in the sort of 1950s, 60s, and even in the 70s as um, propellants in aerosols. They were used as refrigerants in um, fridges. They were used as blowing agents to make polymers um, squashy. So they were filled with gas to make them spongy. They were chosen for this reason because of their inertness. Now that, in a sense, causes a big problem because these gases, when they are released into the atmosphere, they don't do anything. They just sit around. They're not water soluble, so they don't get washed out by the rain. And eventually, this will end up in the stratosphere, where it is exposed to UV. Now, I've deliberately shown this bond here, the CCL bond, because this, is, this has a lower bond enthalpy than the CF bond. So UV will break this bond. Now, one electron will be taken or kept by this chlorine, and this electron will be kept by this part of the, the, the remaining part of the, the molecule. And so, we've seen this before in the chlorination of methane mechanism, we're going to end up with two free radicals. So the chlorine radical with its unpaired electron and we're going to end up with the CFCl2 radical. So I don't know if you can remember from your mechanism this is called an initiation step because we have a stable molecule forming two free radicals. And because the electron pair in the bond is shared equally, so the chlorine gets one of the electrons and this gets the other electron, this is called homolytic fission. So now this chlorine radical exists in the stratosphere, it will go on and react with ozone. So basically, the chlorine radical will take out an oxygen atom from the ozone and form a new radical, the ClO radical, and it will also form a molecule of O2. Now, this is what we call a propagation step, and propagation steps always occur in, in pairs, so this is the first one, so we'll call it P1. So the radical, this new radical that's been formed, feeds into P2, propagation 2. So this is the ClO radical, and that's going to react with an oxygen atom. They will combine and form an oxygen molecule, and what's left, a Cl radical. So what we're going to do now is work out the overall equation for these two propagation steps and if you treat it like a simultaneous equation in maths so we're going to add all of the reactants together and all of the products together you can see that we'll have 
a chlorine radical on either side of the overall equation. So all I'm going to do is just cancel those out and would also have this ClO radical on either side of the overall equation. So what we're left with is O3 plus O makes two O2s. And you can see this overall equation is showing that ozone is being destroyed. Now we can say a little bit more about the chlorine radical, the, the role of the chlorine radical in this process. Because it's used in the first propagation step, but then reformed in the second propagation step, it is acting as a catalyst. So you sometimes see these two reactions referred to as the catalytic breakdown of ozone and it's catalyzed by this chlorine radical. And scientists think that one chlorine radical can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules. Eventually the chlorine radical will, will combine with another radical and become stable again. But they think about 100,000 of these cycles, this chain reaction, will take place before it becomes stable again. So very, very harmful for the environment, these chlorine radicals. So finally, we'll have a, a look at how scientists can help to combat the problem. So the first one I've got is scientists could measure or monitor levels of ozone and ozone depleting chemicals in the atmosphere. And that data would then be fed to governments, politicians, who would meet at protocols, so that's gatherings of many countries, where they would make some promises as to moving forward. So cutting levels of various chemicals, possibly banning certain chemicals from being used again. And the protocol that took place that was directly linked to ozone was held in Montreal. Remember, it was Kyoto for the greenhouse effect. And just to give you a flavour of the kind of things that were decided at Montreal, so countries decided to ban the use of CFCs. They promised they would stop using CCL4, which is a very, very, was a very, very widely used solvent at the time. And you can see there's chlorine in the molecule, therefore when it reaches the stratosphere, the same thing can happen. Chlorine radical could be produced. And countries also decided to stop using halon fire extinguishers. And finally, another way scientists can help is to develop alternatives to CFCs. So once these chemicals were agreed by the countries at Montreal, um, that they would no longer be used. Scientists developed alternatives such as HFCs, which uh, are hydrofluorocarbons. Um, so you can see in the name there's no chlorine in there. So they, they aren't as um, damaging or they won't damage the ozone layer. These things, unfortunately, are greenhouse gases. So you're sort of solving one problem but creating another one. Um, there's no perfect solution to this. Another example that you could use is um, something called supercritical CO2. So basically that's just CO2 under certain um, temperature and pressure becomes a liquid and liquid CO2 is actually replaced all these um, ozone depleting solvents like CCL4. So this is being used in lots of chemical processes now um, instead of these harmful um, CFCs and um, CCL4 type substances.